to lecture 2.2 in our summer series on cognition. Today we're going to be talking about pattern recognition. So today we're going to be starting with uh, module 2.2. Uh, our lecture today is going to be on pattern recognition. So welcome to lecture 2.2 in cognition in our summer series. Again, we'll be talking about pattern recognition today. So we talked previously about different issues in perception, uh, one of which has to do with how it is that we're able to um, see objects, letters, words, whatnot in the world. So when we talk about pattern recognition, we're talking about the process by which we recognize an object or event as being familiar, then label or identify that object. So we're talking about face recognition, speech recognition, identifying letters, words, etc. This is a relatively unique human characteristic. It's only been relatively recently that we've been able to get computers to recognize patterns as well as humans, human beings can, and we're still not quite there yet. Um, so computers can now, of course, identify letters and does a pretty good job of matching faces, uh, but still the best match is uh, conducted by humans. Uh, so we're getting better at this kind of um, complex task with computers, but humans seem to be particularly well suited for it. So we're going to start by talking about template matching theory. So this is the first theory trying to examine how it is that we are able to recognize so many things out in the world. And according to this theory, patterns are identified by stored templates uh, for each uniquely recognized item. So basically we're comparing a stimulus out in the environment to this template to see if they match. And so it's basically, it's kind of like when you were a kid and you had to line up the block to fit it in through the um, hole that matched up that particular block, so you had a square block and a triangle block and a circle block. Well, that's basically how these templates work. We match up the template, uh, the two fit one another, and we can then identify some kind of match. And so we're basically identifying each object holistically according to this theory. There are a number of problems with uh, template matching theory uh, from the start, and I want to go through a few of these and then we'll uh, take a look at a possible alternative explanation for uh, pattern recognition. The first of these has to do with pattern variation. And essentially, uh, you would have to have a template for every different variant of the same stimulus. Uh, so all of these are the letter A. Uh, we have no difficulty determining that these are the letter A. However, uh, we would require a different template for each one of these. And that seems to be rather uh, non-parsimonious. Uh, that is a pretty cumbersome way in which we uh, would think to be able to identify a particular object. Uh, the other problem with template matching theory uh, that doesn't hold up particularly well is we're able to identify objects that are not in their normal orientation, that is they're tilted to one degree or another. Now the early research in template matching theory um, tried to account for this by saying what you would do is you had to mentally rotate the letter or object so that it matched the template, which is why it took longer to identify letters in these uh, alternative um, locations. Uh, the other alternative is that you would have to have a template for each of these additional um, orientations. Again, not a very parsimonious explanation. Uh, the really, I think, most damaging uh, phenomenon for template matching theory are some of the gestalt phenomena that we talked about, particularly the good prognos um, figures. So in this uh, figure you see before you, you can see a three-dimensional cube that does not exist. So it's difficult to imagine how you can match an object that doesn't exist to a template because we're matching something that isn't there uh, to a template. And so it's almost impossible uh, on its own for template matching theory to um, explain this kind of phenomenon. Uh, the final thing that's a couple things that are particularly difficult, we can oftentimes reckon th rec recognize objects and stimuli out in the environment that we've never seen before and that's obviously uh, problematic because if we haven't seen it before how could we have a template for it? Uh, and it also requires 
essentially an infinite number of templates uh, for us to be able to recognize everything in our environment that we can. <coughs> so these are some of the issues with template matching theory. Uh, we'll move on to talk then about feature theories, or what are often called feature detection theories. And according to this kind of theory, uh, certain defining features and their combinations are the central recognition strategy. And each item is then associated with a set of common features. So uh, rather than identifying the entire object, we're identifying individual features and the way in which they're combined as a central recognition strategy. So this is um, taking the parts, putting them together, and recognizing uh, items and objects in that particular way. So for example, we might take these individual features and come up with the letter A. And then any variation of these kinds of features can still be recognized as the letter A. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so this entire process is accomplished by what we call analysis by synthesis. So we extract um, these individual features from what's called the sensory register. And the sensory register is simply a temporary holding place um, for uh, sensory information. It's a very brief memory system. We then can match uh, the features that have been extracted uh, in long-term memory. We can compare those features, and then a decision is made about what it is that we're seeing. So uh, the way this is happening then is we extract the features, look at their combination, compare it with information we have in memory, and then make some sort of decision about the object in front of us. Excuse me. Uh, there are some central predictions of feature theories. One of these is, in fact, what we call perceptual confusions. This simply reflects the number of features that stimuli have in common. So the more features in common, uh, the greater the confusion. Uh, it's more difficult to detect differences in stimuli with a large number of shared features. And there's a classic experiment by Ulrich Neisser uh, in which he had participants search for items in an array of other items that were either very similar or very different. And in fact, for class, uh, we have a demonstration for you to do um, that will demonstrate this particular phenomenon. So those of you in my um, cognition class, uh, this is a good time to go off and do that uh, demonstration and come back to this particular lecture. Um, so when we're talking about these kind of perceptual confusions, we're talking about things like letters that are very similar, um, identical twins that aren't always completely identical but very close, different model years of the same car, can we tell those apart? These can be very perceptually confusing. So there's a visual search demonstration available online for my students. I will also post um, a video a version of that to YouTube as well. Um, and so you should be able to find that. So if you want, you can pause this here and come back to it um, after you've done that uh, visual search demonstration. <coughs> so some advantages of feature theories um, are they solve many of the problems associated with template matching theory. We can deal with different orientations, we can deal with different pattern variations, and we can even deal with some, uh, but not necessarily all, gestalt phenomenon. Because there are some features there, and those features then allow us to get to the point where we can actually recognize uh, patterns and objects. There are some problems that neither feature theories nor template matching theory are able to account for on their own in uh, data regarding pattern recognition. The first of these are bidirectional images. And these are uh, instances where the exact same stimulus can be seen in different ways. So uh, these can be mood dependent, and they can also be biased by recent experience. And so I want to take a look at some of these so you can see I know, exactly what we're talking about. So this is a nice sampling of bidirectional images. This one in the upper left-hand corner here is called the Necker cube. Uh, you can actually see it as a cube with this top square as the top of the cube or the top of the box. Or you can actually flip the cube around so that this square is actually the top of the box. I like to call these the Cubert stairs. Some of you may remember Cubert from back in the day. So you can actually see these as sort of a set of 
cubes that result in a stairs going upwards, or you can reverse it the other direction so that these are the tops. So the thing comes out the other direction. It's a little difficult to do, but you can make it happen. Uh, same with this one. Oh, this one drives me nuts because it flips back and forth. So you can see it either as a bench, so this is the seat and the back, or you can flip it around so that it's upside down. So this is the back and this is sort of the, what would be the seat. Um, this one you can see as a tunnel going sort of in one direction or the other, and then this is called the impossible trident. Um, <coughs> this is a, from a great website that I no longer exists, unfortunately, that was called Delusion Works. Um, and here, of course, you can see one face staring out at you, or you can see two faces staring at each other, and it kind of freaks you out because you can flip it back and forth. Um, I, for me, it's easiest to see the one face if I look up here at the eyes. If you look down here at the nose and mouth, you can see them staring at each other. Ah, this one's great. There are some faces hidden in this um, particular example. So if you take, take, give you a second to kind of eyeball this and see if you can find uh, the faces. I believe there are at least three there may be more. Uh, there's a face here, there's another one here, and there's one over here. There might even be more somewhere, um, but those are certainly ones that uh, you can see. This is a classic um, called Wife and Mother-in-Law. I did not name it that, so don't um, send letters. This one in the middle is the sort of original, what we call unbiased version, in which you can see either the uh, younger woman or the older woman in uh, this particular stimulus. If you look over uh, at this one on the left, this one's biased more towards the younger woman. This one over here on the right's biased more towards the older woman. So if you are unable to see them, uh, this is the mouth of the older woman, her chin and her nose and her eye. For the younger woman, she's looking away, and this is her chin, her jawline, and her ear, nose, and this is a necklace or uh, something of the sort. Just for historical fun, this is actually the original um, piece of artwork that that came from. It was some sort of sales postcard. I have no earthly idea what they might have been selling with it, uh, but this is what it looked like. This is a nice modern version. We'll go ahead and call this one husband, father-in-law in which there is both a younger man and an older man. Uh, for time's sake, we'll see the older man. This is his mouth, his eye, and his nose. For the younger man, he's looking away again. Jawline, nose, eyebrows, and then this is a scarf or handkerchief or something tied around his neck. The other problem we have is uh, coming up with both of these feature defects detection theories in particular, is coming up with exactly what are defining features. Um, some stimuli are hard to define. There's always some sort of exception to the rule, um, yet we don't have any difficulty identifying what uh, certain things are. So while something may look like a strange, crazy car, we can identify it as a car. Um, similarly with glassware, there's all sorts of different glassware, but we can always, almost always identify them uh, by what they are. And there are always things that aren't exactly fitting the rule. Cars with three wheels, uh, that sort of thing. Another problem with both feature detection and template matching is we observe what are called context effects. And that is the context of an object, an item, a letter, or a word um, determines either what we see or how accurately we see something. So the first we can talk about is called the word superiority effect. In the word superiority effect, participants are faster and more accurate at finding a letter contained in a word than in a non-word. So if we present uh, to participants the stimuli and simply ask them, is there a, as soon as you see the letter T, press a button, um, or can you tell me if the letter T was in the previous um, stimuli? Either of these are uh, both uh, acceptable in ways in which I've seen this done. And what we find is that participants are much more accurate and much faster at finding a letter in a word than in a non-word. So in this example, it might be the letter K. Um, we'd be faster and more accurate at finding it in the word ticket than the uh, string of letters below. 
Now the important thing is neither template matching theory nor feature theories can account for this because the context in terms of visual features is the same for both of these. Um, it's just simply one forms a word and the other one does not. So the only difference between these two is that uh, one forms a meaningful context and the other one does not, although the visual context is still the same. Um, so that's the word superiority effect. We also uh, can see other context effects in which the context actually determines what we perceive. So a single stimulus can be perceived differently depending on the context. So this is a classic example of that, where the exact same stimulus is either the letter B or the number 13, depending on which context you might see. So both um, feature theories and template matching theories um, are lacking uh, a way in which to accommodate these kind of context effects. And the reason for that is both involve only bottom-up or what we call data-driven processing. Um, and that's a particular problem. So I want to spend some time talking about bottom-up processing um, and exactly what we mean by that and then talk about top-down processing as a way to uh, accommodate these effects. So bottom-up processing occurs when the analysis of objects, we start by analyzing objects into parts. Processing starts with those basic units and our perception is then built on the foundation laid by these units. The critical piece here is that uh, with bottom-up processing, we're only talking about taking the features, putting them together into a perception. It's based entirely on the data in front of us, the visual stimuli that we can see, um, and nothing more. But clearly, as we've seen, perception is influenced by higher cognitive processes. So while bottom-up processing is certainly a part of perception, there is more to it than that. And that uh, what we're actually missing is how our knowledge our experience and our expectations can drive perception. And so that gets us to top-down processing. And in top-down processing, global knowledge helps us to detect patterns. Processing is based on higher level information, such as meaningful context, observer knowledge, experience, biases, emotional state. All of these things can drive our perception. So our recent experience can oftentimes really bias our perception. And in fact, in uh, I believe it's the next lecture, um, we'll be talking about uh, applications of visual perception. And in fact, what we see is that expertise can oftentimes mislead us in our visual perception, and that can actually be dangerous. Sometimes we also call this conceptually driven processing because it's concepts that are driving our processing. So our knowledge of language is what helps us um, see uh, and recognize letters more quickly in the word superiority effect. Our mood, our recent experiences, um, can bias our perception of um, those bidirectional images. So all of this is occurring because of top-down processing. I want to note one thing about top-down processing um, that is something we have all seen and experienced that is problematic. And that has to do with uh, proofreading our own work. The problem with proofreading your own work is you know what you meant to say and you know what you meant, what word you meant. And so when we go to read through something we've written, oftentimes we read what we meant to say, not what is actually in front of us, because our knowledge and expectations are what's driving that. And so it's really careful, it's really difficult um, to proofread your own work. And even others will proofread your work, oftentimes knowing what you meant, and will have a difficult time trying to uh, find uh, errors. So it's something to keep in mind. So this is the basic idea. Um, we have sensory input coming in uh, to a pattern recognition, you know, say, process. But we also have information from long-term memory coming down. So sensory input is coming from the bottom up, and long information from long-term memory is coming from the top down. And between uh, these two processes, we then get an output of what it is that we see or experience. So we'll pick up here on uh, applied perception uh, in our next lecture.